Thank you very much, Dr. Gray. Uh, as part of this event, we like to kind of showcase some of our best and brightest high degree research students and uh, one of our most um, intellectually exciting students is uh, Brian Timothy Wang. Uh, he kind of does work across construction law and housing law. Uh, we've been kind of collaborating a little bit of late. Uh, he kind of did very well in the three minute thesis burst. And uh, in, in spite of uh, new developments coming in his personal life, he's nonetheless kind of agreed kindly to talk to us today about open cities, openness as a basis for trustworthiness in smart cities. Thanks, Matthew. Testing. Okay. All right, I'll stand on that side of here because I'm a little easier to use my clicker this way. All right. Okay. Um, so this paper this is, is kind of paper three out of my PhD thesis, and it's something that I, I'm sort of working through. So I'm slowly moving towards open data um, because I see it as a basis for us to talk about benevolence within sort of the area or as an element of trustworthiness. So. What I wanted to do is begin by talking about surveillance. Now, surveillance is huge uh, in the field of architecture as well as law. Um, surveillance has long been used to drive decisions about the city. And if you consider the types of surveillance that are now available to us, you know, we've got natural surveillance or people surveilling each, each other on the streets, we've got video surveillance, aerial surveillance, interception of communications, biometric surveillance. But the one that I'm quite interested in is data valence, which is ba basically about sensor-generated data, um, particularly around the city and how that's being used to drive decisions. So we're talking about urban data. Uh, of course, there are other things like surveillance, social surveillance, and the use of an analysis by computer programs on that sort of urban data that's retrieved. That's something that, that we're seeing. So the proliferation of sensors in the built environment has given us an unprecedented ability to sort of a, you know, aggregate huge data sets and to model physical assets of the city. And when I talk about physical assets of the city, we're talking about not just, you know, buildings, we're talking about components of buildings, um, things like wind turbines and stuff like that, and progressively, you know, to components of the city like neighborhood precincts, um, sort of transport infrastructure, as well as on a national scale, you know, cities, modeling cities and the infrastructure that spans between cities. So. These sort of sensors are getting cheaper, and so therefore data acquisition is getting cheaper. But it's still very expensive, and you know so it, it, the only entities that can really develop these kind of common data environments are really sort of public uh, sector entities or um, huge tech companies like Google. And <laughs> so there are now predictions, of course, that you know by next year we'll have 20 billion of these sensors that are all sitting around and chatting to each other, machine to machine, and the Internet of Things. And so what this allows us to do is then create these digital replicas called digital twins. Um, and this is a concept that's sort of come up into fruition in the sort of city space or the urban space in the last two years. And they allow us to utilize real-time inputs to simulate the effect of changes that, that are happening right now on the ground, as well as you know, model or forecast what will happen in real time if we were to do something right now. Now, that's quite an unclear definition of a digital twin. So if you want to think about a digital twin, think about how an automated vehicle actually <laughs> navigates through a city. So it's moving in the physical environment, but how it navigates is through a digital overlay or a digital sort of replica of the city. But this digital replica has to be giving and feeding information to it in real time. So that's really about um, the digital twin. But the concept itself is not super fresh. The term itself of digital twin has really come into that, that urban space in the last two or three years. But we've always had building information modeling, so components of the city, uh, or common data environments. And then on an urban planning sort of scale or urban scale, we've had you know, sort of 3D GIS um, and different kinds of software. And I'll talk about a, a little bit more about how different sort of um, urban operating systems or data infrastructure have been looked at in the field of architecture and technology for maybe about 15 years. But the idea that we've sort of latched onto is that digital twins differ from these kinds of digital models because they're connected with this digital thread to the sensors that are embedded in our built environment. Um, so I was attending uh, the first or the inaugural uh, Southeast Queensland, uh, I think, uh, session on the digital twin last week. 
And really, I think there was one of the speakers who expressed, I guess, uh, cynicism that this is not particularly novel because um, you know, we've been talking about BIMs for the last 40 years. And how do we know that this is not actually one sort of more advanced version of the BIM? Um, and I, to a large extent, I agree with that because uh, I do think it's a, a sort of a one step beyond what BIMs can do. But we've latched onto the concept of digital twins because it's hugely successful in the field of manufacturing where it's been sort of in effect for the last 10 years. And how it's entered into the cities is because as manufacturing increases and we're doing bigger and bigger things like wind turbines, train, airport, ship parts, utility infrastructure, and offshore platforms, we've seen that, hey, we can actually use this. And if we agglomerate and pull together all this data, we can create better models of our cities. So digital twins and other common data environments aim to make data more valuable. It's about delivering savings and direct benefits to the cities through public sector, sector open data. And the Minister for Business and Industry in the UK was talking about how the value of data grows exponentially as it's aggregated and shared. So when you have the convergence of smart infrastructure, modern methods of construction, and the digital economy, you have the ability to then use data to improve the citizen quality of life and well-being. Now, that's quite a general statement. What they're actually intending to do with digital twins is really to inform decision-making process and then progressively automate these same decision-making processes. So Richard Buttle from Huawei, he's the chief innovation officer there, talked about the purpose of the digital twin is ultimately about starting to automate decisions in support of efficiency or effectiveness or economic outcomes that saves cost, time, and, hum and you know, or replicates human behavior. So what that means is that the deployment of the digital twin actually then changes our practice of city making from one that is informed by data to actually one that is driven by data valence because it controls what you actually see. What do you actually see and how you frame the problem that you're about to solve in the city is really now then guided by the design of these data valence systems. And a lot of how we are talking about data valence practices is about creating seamlessness, where we go straight from the collection of data and the analysis is one seamless process to pushing out a decision, which is something that is dangerous. So my research examines the goal of seamlessness in data valence to decision practices in smart cities and what we're going to do about it and how we can trust these. And they sit within my larger sort of PhD topic of how we can trust machines to guide decision making or make decisions for us about the city and construction. So in architecture, I teach in the UQ Architecture School sometimes. And um, one of the things I love talking about is this project called Planet IT Valley that was meant to be in Portugal. And it was the first city conceived by technologists, for technologists, in which the architecture and urban planning are all but beside the point. Um, and I was quite outraged because I do have an, a background in architecture. I go, architects are missing a big trick, not thinking that they need to be more engaged with business and technology communities, the world is passing them by. And that's a quote by a professor at the Harvard Business School. That sounds quite controversial when I first read it. But actually, there's a certain truth to it. Because architects love talking to other architects. They're not very good at talking outside of that. And so the lessons that have been gleaned over centuries of tinkering around it with cities, and these changes take actually a long time to actually be sort of analyzed and felt. And so you know, it, it takes a long, long time to actually process what these changes do to a city. We're not very good at communicating outside of the, the field of architecture. But I think it was really interesting when I showed the kids these um, sort of proposals. You can see that there's a lot, not a lot of, I guess, uh, intervention by someone of urban planning or architectural forms. It looks very much like a sim city kind of generated kind of, oh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have um, sensors that are going to sort of deal with renewable energy or address all these different things. But when you don't pull in somebody with that ability to create cities, you'll find that this doesn't work. And so this project ultimately failed. And the critique of this that was given, and when they analyzed all this, was that they realized that the technologists who had designed the city had not anticipated what they were designing, or how, the, how that design would be used, or how it would be, or how it would affect the city, and whether we can trust this. And the reality is that we've had been having this discussion about how data is going to shape the city for a pretty long time. So like I said 
Digital twins as a concept is not particularly new. We've had urban operating systems being talked about for the last, say, 10 to 15 years. So we have IBM's Smart City, Abotica's City Operating System, Microsoft City Next, Hitachi's vision for smart cities that use set center data to guide decisions around what's happening with the city. If you go back a little bit further, we had William White's work in the 1960s where you know, he set up all these um, video cameras around New York City and that helped guide the zoning of New York City. We've had a long practice of using data from the city such as from census, household information, transport information to make decisions about how we shape uh, and, and uh, the way we live, work, and play. Um, to me, I think the modern father of using data to shape the city is probably Arnold Amsters. Um, and if you think about this quote that comes, or his, this concept, concept that, that came up from the 1960s, he was looking at how we digest the complexity of the city by using computers, computers were not very advanced in the 1960s, to synthesize and maintain a representation of total environment and then structuring the environment into categories and subcategories of information, and then developing clear objectives and criteria for evaluation to examine what is appropriate knowledge and forms of decision making. And that's what I want to do and tease out as part of this particular paper that I'm working on. But I think the key thing to take away from the 1960s and that particular part of William White is Jane Jacobs is a contemporary of, of William White, and I think William White was her mentor, was really about looking at this, how we look in what we see in terms of the city is also deeply embedded in the practice of how we create trust in the city through passive surveillance, particularly on eyes on the streets. And you know, we've talked about the different types of surveillance earlier. But as we relocate our surveillance practices to the machine, there's a breaking of these natural kind of trust relations that develop in the city. Now, Julie Cohen sort of argues that we haven't paid enough attention to the processes by which power relations are encoded in technologies and artifacts. But in architecture, we've been having a conversation for a long time about this. What happens when architecture or urban planning embed surveillance or data valence practices? So in architecture, we tend to talk about it in terms of the asymmetrical gaze. And we talk about how sort of monitoring that happens through surveillance has a purpose to influence, manage, direct behavior in order to protect and or enhance lives, positions, and property. Kim Dovey, who I, I worked with um, at the University of Melbourne, talked about this kind of embedded surveillance in architecture as a form of coercion, a form of power over. And a lot of the, I guess, discussion or discourse that comes from architecture on this space was really driven by Foucault's analysis of Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon. So if you look at this, talk about this failing state. So Kim Dovey talks about the different kinds of force or power over that happens in architecture. So you have force, which is a very overt kind of power over, where you have a wall or a door. You can only go through there. You can only be in this space um, to sort of force you to behave in certain ways in architecture. You've got authority, which is sometimes you know, when you've got really amazing mythological structures like you know, the Sydney Opera House, where you behave in a certain way around it because it's built out symbolic capital. But the one that I'm really interested in is the idea of coercion. And specifically, one of the three forms of coercion, so it's manipulation. So intimidation is really, if you look at the architecture of the Nazis, um, Albert Spears was the architect there that created so the Cathedral of Lights. And so you had um, these really powerful structures that would intimidate you into behaving in a certain way. But it's a lot more subtle now. So coercion happens in a very manipulative form where the subject is ignorant and there is a concealment of intent to control the subject when you look at data valence practices that happen in a city. So my argument is that open data and all the principles of open data are really about guarding against this manipulation that happens and looking at that, and that's a form of benevolence. So there's a conceptual framework of trust that I'm employing throughout um, my PhD and all the papers I looked at. Um, a team of management scientists uh, from the 19, uh, 1995 looked at uh, how we trust. And there's two components of this. So one is the trusters, the person giving trust, their propensity to trust. And then we look at the other part, which is the person receiving the trust, 
whether they behave in a trustworthy manner. And so they analyzed all the literature on trust. And they came up with three different concepts or elements. The first is ability, the second is benevolence, and integrity. So ability is really about you showing competency and being able to deliver a task. Um, integrity is for you to behave in a way that complies with the value systems that are around the way. So you know, whether it reflects norms, whether it complies with regulations. In a lot of ways, we can do that. So when you talk about computers and programs, we're seeing that computers are able to show more and more ability that's able to then you know, replicate or, or, or achieve better results than a human can. In terms of integrity, we can actually code a machine to actually comply with our norms, our laws, and our regulations. But this third element is actually quite tricky. How does a machine show benevolence, whether it shows a positive orientation towards the people that, that it's interacting with? individually and collectively as a person. And that's something that I think open data is able to, to deliver. So in, in terms of the concept of the digital twins, because the technology is still in its infancy, digital twins can only demonstrate a limited ability. Remember how even though sensors are getting cheaper and the collection of data is getting cheaper, the actual construction of these common data environments and portals are actually extremely expensive only being able to be delivered by governments or big tech companies. But what we're seeing right now is because we don't have that ability yet, the industry is actually moving towards formulating industry norms, standards, and potential regulatory framework. And these norms will then influence that element of, of ability. So this is integrity, ability. And so what happens then is that these norms will then set the technical brief by which the element of ability is demonstrated. One of these sort of standards that are coming out right now are the Gemini principles sort of espoused by the UK Centre for Digital Built Britain, so CDBB. And these are the components that, that are talked about. And the component that I'm really curious and, and interested in is the idea of openness and curation. Openness is really about the open data principles. But curation is about building transparency in the system so that we understand who controls the data and how that data is being curated to keep its quality up there and correct. So open data, a Gemini principle five on openness talks about open data, open culture, open standards, open source. A lot of people here who will probably know way more about this than I do. To build trust, to reduce costs and create more value. Openness is also about transparency and accountability. And curiously, accountability is only used once in the entire document when they talk about the Gemini principles. And it's in relation to data ownership. But if you expand that to really consider what transparency is, it's used in this way to describe transparency of purpose, transparency of data open, uh, ownership, the level of quality of data, and governance structures, which I think are important in shaping the way we create the systems. So I'm saying that these principles collectively help you define or create uh, a, a way of demonstrating benevolence, which should then shape the kind of standards and norms that are developing in terms of the integrity part, which will then drive the creation of the technical brief to show ability. So openness, accountability, and transparency go towards demonstrating benevolence, a reversal of the crushing of process space that's characterized by seamlessness. So, so this is something that I'm working with um, Mark Burden, one of my supervisors on. So he talks about how there's a form of power which arises when we create the seamlessness. You know how we talked about just now where we have data valence that travels through all the way seamlessly into a decision output? That is actually a form of crushing of process space. Our collection is, ana where our collection is analysis, analysis is outcome, prediction is prescription, and sensor is a nudge. I think that the principles of open data and the ones that we explored in the slide before then uncrush this collapse of data valence to decision practices and allow us to then create um, a way of demonstrating benevolence that will flow through um, to create trustworthy machines. So that's kind of where I'm at with my research at the moment. This part is a little underbaked, um, so I'm working on that. Um, yeah, so that's, well, I'll talk about questions later on. Well, thank you. <laughs>